So I am Diane True. I am the Vice President of the Ellington Historical Society. The Ellington Historical Society is a nonprofit, 501c3. We're funded by membership dues, grants, and donations, basically. Um, and we share, we collect, preserve, and share the history of our rural community through collections, exhibitions, and events. Um, we, you have probably have noticed living in Ellington the last couple of years, there's been quite a lot of changes. At the Historical Society, starting in about 2020, but in 2023, you notice we were able to put up a pavilion. Um, we have the, one of the rooms, the dining room, due to the um, contributions from our annual appeal, we were able to repair all the plaster walls in that room. It's done, it's painted, it looks beautiful. It's going to be our exhibit room. We go into the schools. Um, we have a couple volunteers that, especially third grade, it's mandated in the state of Connecticut to, for third graders to study their town history. One of our members put together a beautiful packet for third grade. It has been old, it was 30 years old, and now it's modern, and the teachers are loving it. They also go into some of the lower classrooms with hands-on exhibits. Um, and we have started providing talks, it's three so far. And we keep repeating them because um, people are asking. So this one is in History Crystal Lake. We have the history of the immigration of the Russian Jews into Ellington, and the history of the in immigration of the Swiss German into Ellington or our other talks. And um, we probably will repeat them because every time we have them, it's sold out. So we'll just keep going. So the next thing up, my little thing, we're having an antique uh, village. <coughs> Vintage and Antique Market, May 4th, so if you know anybody looking for dealers, it's basically you rent a space, it's going to be May 4th, there's some flyers up here. Um, if you know anybody that um, sells vintage or antique stuff, or if you want to get together and clean out your attics, <laughs> please take a, uh, a flyer for that. So, the history of Crystal Lake. Wild Quasset. It basically means where the cattails go, or where the flaggy flags grow. Um, I know too fast in my thing. So, if you go back to Ellington, I want you to remember this statement. It comes into play towards the end. Town of Ellington is incorporated and gained all legal rights to all bodies of water and the land beneath the lakes including Square Pond. Crystal Lake was first called Square Pond. Square Pond is located in the northeastern tip of Ellington and flows into Stafford. It's fed by four streams. It was peaceful, forested area with crystal clear blue water. So, starting in the 1800s, there was a Native American settlement on the um, end near, the, near Stafford. They were there till the 1800s. Um, and that's who named it Wabakwasset, which means flaggy pond or places where the flags grow, referring to the cattails that grew around it. It was beautiful, abundant fishing and beautiful shore. Um, and that's a picture of what a typical Nipmunk home looked like. So the first thing that happens is in the 1700s, there's a Methodist movement, especially in New England. And um, 1792, the first meeting house of the Crystal Lake Community Methodist Church was built. So we still have that church. So that was built, um, and then they built a second meeting house. It was built in 1834 on Sandy Beach Road, but then they moved it. They used to move building down that. <laughs> they moved it to its location where it is now. During that time, there was a split in the church, and a church, and a it split, and then another church formed, and it was the Advent Church. It didn't succeed because it's, there weren't enough people, so they split into two churches. They didn't have enough people at either church, and so the Advent Church was closed, and then they moved that church across the street and hooked it on to the Methodist Church. Um, but the very um, significant thing is the parsonage, they also moved, um, is the oldest parsonage in New England. 
was built in 1795, and it's across the street from the Methodist Church, right in front of Center School. So it's a very historic building. Crystal Lake School. It still exists. It's still there. Crystal Lake School. Crystal Lake School. Yeah. Crystal Lake School. Yeah. Did I say Center? Yeah. Because yeah. oh, okay. yeah. I went there. Yeah. So what happens in 1815, four families move into the area. Richardson, Dimmick, Aborn, Newell. A small community is born. And they mostly settled on the Stafford end of it, that end of the lake is where these farms were. Ooh, this thing's not turning. I don't know. I have to put my finger again. I got it. Oh, got it. Okay. So this is very interesting. I, so in 1824, the last of the Nipmunk Native American Americans leave. Why did they leave? There was a man. And who murdered his wife, George Henry Washington. He was a member of that Nippon community. He murders his wife, he gets arrested, and he's going to be hanged. And they basically, um, this is a newspaper clipping, they hang him on the Tallinn Green. And according to this newspaper article, 10,000 people came to watch him be hung. I have a problem with that. <laughs> Where are they coming up with 10,000 people? We are talking 1824. I mean, where did they come from? I, I don't know. But that's what the newspaper said. I'm, I'm just... There was no television. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Like some of the things, the day of the execution was pleasant and a vast concourse of people assembled probably not less than 10,000. Perfect regularity was, however, preserved, and no unfortunate accident occurred. So apparently, he basically said, I did it. I'm guilty. I'll take my punishment. 10,000. I don't know. So when the first family did it, so their land is by the dam, which is the Stafford end of the lake. Wow. So he owns a land around it, and he owns the flowage rights of water over that dam. So a natural stone dam is built on that north end of the lake. <laughs> so he sells those flow rights to Stafford Mineral Springs, which is in Stafford. Okay? So they, um, he leases the land, and the mill grows, and um, the dam is improved, and when they improve that land, that dam, Crystal Lake increases by almost 40 percent. And Crystal Lake is the size of what it is today from increasing that dam. It's born, it's 50 feet deep, it covers 172 acres and is crystal clear. So before that, it was much smaller. Next thing that happens is find the, the uh, families in the area saying we need a school. And they build the first one-room schoolhouse in 1861. It was it became a two-room schoolhouse in 1929, but they didn't get a bathroom till 1949. <laughs> <laughs> this is an actual picture of a classroom from Crystal Lake School class in 1896. What's interesting, it must be winter or fall because they all have shoes on. Because in our archives, and we have pictures of old classrooms, most of the time the kids don't have shoes on. So either they wore their shoes for the picture, or it was colder weather. So at first, Crystal Lake was called Square Pond. It was also referred to as Ruby Pond, because there were garnets, and there still are, around the lake. So this man grew up in Crystal Lake, a native of Crystal Lake, and he became a lawyer and he moved to Chicago. And he was responsible for getting the name changed to Crystal Lake. I've heard, I can't document that it was named that because of the crystal clear water and the crystal clear ice that was harvested from the lake. No proof. <laughs> So the first, so now Crystal Lake starts becoming a tourist attraction. So the first building that goes up is Crystal Lake Hotel. Built in 1894, that is a picture of it. 
and it is a destination spot for people far and wide. <coughs> it's located just south of um, where the boat launch is. There's a road there, Hotel Road, and that's where the hotel was. And there might be like a, some little artifact of something, but not much that you can tell that it's there in the, uh, on the space. But it, it was a big deal. It had 23 guest rooms, bowling alley, dining room, tavern pool, billiard tables. But it burnt to the ground in 1935. A story that I did hear, which I hope to believe, um, these things are hard to document, is during Prohibition, they would be um, notified they were going to be raided, and they would take the barrels of liquor and throw them in the lake. <laughs> and then when they left, they'd just go get them back. Because <laughs> in truth, nobody really wanted Prohibition. I mean, nobody. <laughs> Except the ladies who pushed for it. What helped Crystal Lake really be booming is trolleys. So trolleys come. It made a big difference um, in getting people to Crystal Lake. What's interesting about the trolleys is they just didn't last that long. They only lasted 15 to 20 years. Now here's a map of the trolleys. So you can see you could come from Enfield and go to Crystal Lake. Well, I, yeah, you can go to Bristol Lake. You can, it connected with Snipsick Lake. There was also recreation on Snipsick Lake. There was a ferry across Crystal Lake from the Ellington side to the Rockville side. Um, there was, um, you could take a train into Rockville and then get on the trolley and go to the lakes. So it was a big deal to have this trolley, these trolleys, um, to give people access to the, to the lakes. But they just didn't last very long. And I don't know the reason for that. So the next big thing that happens, 1915, Rouse is built. And that's also on the end, the Stafford end of the lake, or the dam. And today, it's actually the last building on West Shore Road. The building is still there. It was built in 1915. It was a dance hall. And it's big time now because it's 1915 and people have cars, but they also can go by trolley. And in the 1930s, a thousand people went to Rouse. And that's a lot of people. Basically, um, Stafford was a mill town, Rockville was a mill town, everybody worked six days a week. Saturdays might be half day, and they all took off to the dance halls on Saturday night in mass. Um, the building burned to the ground in 1940, and they rebuilt it. So um, it then became, it was Rouse. It also had a beach there, and um, it was probably one of the deeper beaches. There were three eventually places, but in one of the deeper waters off of this one. Um, so it was Jack's Pavilion for a while, then it became Clearwater Beach Club, and the last thing it was Crystal Lake Beach and Boat Club, and that was owned by Gene Kidney bought it because he had such fond memories of hanging out there as a kid. It's still there as a private residence. Here are some ads just to give you an idea of how popular this place was. Busy season at Crystal Lake, 1915, 1916. I want to know if anybody knows what the word disport means. I had to look it up. Disport at Crystal Lake, dance and rock and swim. Anybody know what it means? <laughs> These words that were so used that we lost them. It basically made, means um, recreation. I thought, you know, like, what is that? I thought, that, I thought it was something bad, disport. It sounds like a negative, but. 1917, Crystal Lake property soars, cottage owners get city prices for rents, and then a big carnival for Crystal Lake, more than 150 canoes. So it was big time. And now, and we're only at 1921. So then, in, starting in 1917, there was a yacht club, very active through the 70s. Um, there was a specific kind of boat that was very popular that they raced. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the boat. A very... I think they were called Comets? Comets. Yes, yeah. exactly. Comets. It was a specific uh, type of sailboat. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to chirp in if you know something or if you have a question. So canoe carnivals, they had them in the 
Starting in 1919, the first event attracted 3,000 spectators. So just think of that today. Like, think of, uh, uh, of, of I mean, 3,000 people is a lot of people. A lot of people. So 1925, um, the Sandy Beach Recreation Area is now built by a couple. And that has a pine grove, a pavilion, <laughs> It has a dance hall, roller skating rink, refreshments, boat houses, canoe lockers, and an open air boxing arena. So during the day, the roller skating rink was a roller skating rink, and they actually had a man play the organ live for the roller skaters, and at night it was a dance hall. The picture's not very good, but there was a big water wheel, a big slide. Um, it was a big time. Big slide. They probably wouldn't let you do that today. That's <laughs> One of the ads for the boxing and then um, the roller skating rink. All gone. Cost a dollar for ringside, but you could get in for 75 cents in the bleachers. The roller skating rink, did it burn? Um, no, it got taken down. It did not burn. So some more ads. Now we're at 1925. Large crowds see well-contested events held at Crystal Lake. State Road proves boom to Ottawa's. They have lots of outing, outings there. 650 children at a picnic. That's a lot of picnic. And Crystal Lake to welcome orchestras. So West Shore Road was the main road. East Shore Road, there was nothing on that side of the lake at this time. So now come the cottages. What I find very interesting, it was very, it attracted people from Long Island, and I can only think that it had to be the Long Island next to New York City, because if you've ever been to the Long Island out there, it's gorgeous. I'm not sure why I'd come to Crystal Lake, but it was really attractive to people from Long Island. And during the Depression, there were still cars, so it was an inexp inexpensive place to rent a cottage. There were two main cottages. The Wendell's cottages were off the lake. Wendell Road, so West Shore Road goes, and then Wendell's like this, so it's up on a hill looking at the lake. They had electricity and running water. Lake View. So um, these are some of the, there was a little pamphlet that um, the Wendells gave us, and it's showing some of the um, cottages, that, the bungalows that were available. The love nest at the bottom, I'm not sure you can see it, but a two bedroom was $20 a week, a four bedroom was $32 a week, and the smaller ones were like $15 a week. You could go and stay at the Wendell's. So the Wendell's still own that property. There are no, um, there are none of the cottages left, but Wendell's still live on the property. <laughs> a couple of the examples of the cottages. Lovely Lucerne, the Love Nest, you can see they're all different sizes. They were from like one bedroom, I think one of them had five bedrooms. The other cottages were Lassie's cabins, and those were right on West Shore Road. No electricity, no plumbing. Community, outhouse. Um, but Lassie's promise, never a dull moment at the Lakeside Tourist Cabins. <laughs> so you have to decide. Lakefront, electricity, and water. Oops. And then we have Jimmy. Jimmy's is still there, the building. So it's a Crystal Lake landmark. It opens, it was owned by James and Selma Cross, and then her, their daughter, Shirley, from 1929 to 2004. So the Crosses owned a grocery store in Hartford, so they had the means for the products, and they, did they come and live? We have. Do they live? At the summer, they must have lived in right there, right on the street. They lived right there, right? Forty-one. 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 Forty-
Here's some other pictures of Jimmy's. This is the fan. <laughs> There's some cool stuff. Lori Spielman claims it's the best French fry she ever had. <laughs> so, Crystal Lake. So, we go back to the um, hotel, original hotel. And the red building up there was the ice house for the hotel that burned down. They took it and moved it, once again, moving buildings, and it became the Crystal Lake Volunteer Fire Department house, and it is still there today. Yeah. They moved it. It's improved since then, but that part of the building is still there. So now our third, so, so before now we have two dance halls happening. Now we get a fourth, a third, 1946, Sir Gals opens. Um, it's Crystal Lake Ballroom, and so anybody that remembers going to Crystal Lake, that's the one you're going to remember because it's the newest. Anybody here meet their spouse at the Crystal Lake Ballroom? I wanted to do something. Oh, yeah! Yay! But it was also a beach, right? So it's a beach, a hot dog stand, slides, changing rooms, outhouses, and they had music. And usually Friday nights was a polka band. No, yeah. Other oh, so Friday nights polka bands, and then more rock and roll type bands on a Saturday night. And they had music there to the mid '70s. I think one of the last bands was Muddy Waters. Um, <laughs> So they had built, at first their concession stand was part uh, on, on a house or part of the house. They had a fire there, so they built a concession stand. I love this picture dancing on the beach. Um, they had a day camp there um, for kids, and it was a very crowded place on the weekends. So weekends were big time. So 1946, now we have three dance halls, a roller skating rink, a boxing rink, and lots of fun on this living. So these are some of the ads from some of the places in Rouse, some of the people, they had some pretty famous musicians come. Um, I remember NRBQ, those guys, but when I think, um, well, Gene Pitney's there, but Duke Ellington's in there somewhere, but it was it was some big time musicians that went um, to these places. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not a music person, so they don't mean anything to me. But we just but there was a lot. So you can see they had them at Rouse, they had it at Sandy Beach, and they had them at Crystal Lake Ballroom. So this is a map kind of showing you. Um, where everything was. So we have Sandy Beach Road, where there's Jimmy's, Crystal Lake School, the fire department, and the church. Then was Surdell's Crystal Lake Ballroom. The Grove was part of Surdell's. It then became, it was sold to, to Pagani's, I believe, in the late 60s or the 60s sometime. Um, the Crystal Lake Hotel was kind of by the boat launch, the out ice house. There was and then Lasky's was really right on the lake, but the pictures couldn't reach. Jack's, Rouse Jack's, the way up. At one time, there was a mini golf up there. And then Wendell's Cottage, you see how Wendell's Road goes up. And the dam is at the top. And East Shore Road was not developed early on. So when it first was developed, at first, I mean, there were no year-round there was no year-round living on Crystal Lake except for one house, one family um, that was year-round. And they lived kind of uh, uh, here, here, right in this area. Um, so it was fun times. Here's some cool pictures at the top. The pictures are from like 1916 to 1920. Um, the bathing suits are great. Kitty beauty pageants, pie eating contest, um, everything was, it was just boot town and lovely. 
And it also was very active during the winter. Um, ice harvesting was very important. Ice harvesting was mostly done by farmers who supplemented their income in the winter by harvesting ice. Um, there was skating and sledding. There was, see the guy on the bottom, they made these um, sailing on ice things. And it's very, when you think, you think of climate change now, um, the story goes, it's, it's really snippet way, but my um, father-in-law was born on December 19th. And he, he's no longer living here. He was the first cesarean section done at Rockville Hospital. And the story goes that the nurse had to ice skate across the snip to get to the hospital. So think about this. December 19th. When have you seen ice on December 19th? When have you seen ice on February 19th? So, yeah. Climate change is real. <laughs> no ice harvesting done. Ice fish fishing. The pictures are small. I apologize, but those are some big hogging fish right there. So, 1957, the residents of the area said, come on, we need a school up here. And finally they got one. 1957, Crystal Lake School is completed. And this is a picture of the original, what it looked like originally. Other things happening on the lake, there was a very active ski club, and that was an amateur ski club, but they were award-winning, they competed, they, and the people in the ski club would be probably around, not in their 90s right now, low 90s, um, it was very active, they even had a jump that they go around and phew, fly up with a jump, um, pretty cool. The other thing down at Crystal Lake was parasailing because the Pioneer Parachute Company in Manchester bought the patent from the guy who invented the parasail. And so very early on, they had, it was one of the very first places with parasailing. And I've never, this guy's when he's parasailing, he's going to land with his water skis. Oh. <laughs> that, that's pretty cool. Um, but it's, I don't know if, I, mean, I haven't seen Paris, maybe it's regulated, but I don't see Paris now. But. So then in 1971, the town buys Sandy Beach property from George, I'm not sure if you would say Bocus or Bacchus. Um, and the dance hall and roller skating rink had been silent and um, abandoned, and they were just removed. The beach was enlarged and fenced in, and they added a parking lot in 1971. Good move by the town. This is one of my most favorite stories <laughs> about the lake. It is fun and amazing. So remember, we had the very beginning in 1786, Ellington is incorporated. So 1988, so we have these flow rights to the dam, okay? The last mill that owned those flow rights, I guess they sold them mm. over the years, was Stafford Printing Company. They're in Stafford. So the purpose of the flow over the lake was it filled their mill ponds to power their mills. And back in the day, the stories from what the women who did grow up on Crystal Lake year-round said, the um, lever to control the dam was this very um, simple mechanical wheel, and they had the right to lower the lake eight feet. They said they owned the top eight feet of the water, and they would go in and lower that lake because they wanted the water, and it really was a problem. I mean, eight feet is very low. You could actually walk all the way along the inside, but then people couldn't stand it that were on the lake and would sneak in at night and look at them. And it happened all the time. Um, so Stafford Printing owns the flow of the water over the dam. They go bankrupt. And a lawyer in Stafford now owns these rights because they went bankrupt and that's what he got. He talks to this guy, Clement Royer, he sells them those rights for $70,000. Now this Royer gives every Buddy who has a place on the lake, a letter says, get your boats out, get your docks 
rocks out. I own Crystal Lake. I'm going to make it um, into a reservoir. It's close to boating, close to swimming. I'm going to build a water bottle company, a luxury golf courses, and condominiums. <laughs> Everybody goes, ah, no, you can't do that. The town of Ellington, um, selectmen of the town, also go, do that. Here, we approve $70,000. We'll buy a map. And the guy goes, oh, that's a million and a half now. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy Cohen, our town historian, have you ever seen the yellow book? She writes a letter. We have the letter. She's kind of kind, but not really, but <laughs> to the point, are you kidding me, guys? Look at when Ellington was incorporated. It got incorporated in 17, what did we say, 86? and included all bodies of water, all land under the lakes. What is the guy out? Don't give this guy a dime. So Royer hires his own surveyor, his own people to investigate. He spends $200,000, and the people he hired come back and say, you don't own anything. <laughs> He's out his, now he goes out of business because he made a dumb move. Now, to this day, his lawyers own those rights. Whatever it means, who knows. But it's just an interesting story. <laughs> but that's what started the Crystal Lake Association, started because of that. They said, oh, we gotta, we gotta, you know, do something about letting people come in here and destroy the lake. But I just find that a very interesting story. So the Crystal Lake Association, they put a lot of work volunteers, they got funding. I'm not sure if they, they might have got small grants, but they worked. And they improved that dam, and that was only completed um, to the state it is today in 2020. And the other thing the Crystal Lake Association is very active in controlling the milfoil invasive weed in the lake. They monitor it, um, and they're very much involved in that. Oops. Okay. So, 2024. Crystal Lake is considered one of the best lakes in eastern Connecticut, a trophy trunk lake, a place with summer and winter recreation at Palm Beach, a state boat launch, and approximately 2,500 residents. And I don't know how many of those are year-round. Um, Crystal Lake is, a, is as popular and beautiful as it was when it was called Wabawasin. And this picture is just one year old, and right about this time of year, it might have been maybe a month maybe in March, but pretty much right around this time of year. Um, you can see how beautiful the lake is. So a lot of these photos come from um, Lynn Bloderfay's book, Crystal Lake, that's available at the Historical Society. And our 2024 exhibit that you have to come see, please, is going to be a happened in Ellington, believe it or not. It will open. Um, on April 20th, it opens when Ellington has its birthday celebration. And there's some really, it's going to feature some pretty famous people that lived in Ellington once that you would be surprised. And some very quirky stories that we have uncovered. And it's going to be very good. If you would like, um, the other things I have, pamphlets on the Ellington Historical Society up here that you can take. There's a clipboard. If you'd like to leave your email, we have a, we send out a newsletter quarterly and an email every once in a while. Um, it's kind of random when we're going to have an event. So our, what we have changed is instead of being open, you know, Thursdays 1 to 3, we changed our, our model to have an event <coughs> once a week, once a month. The reason for that is we need numbers walking through that museum. So even if, and that, the reason for that is to get grants. We've gotten um, some great grants. That's how we, we uh, got our pavilion. And our other big grant um, was an ARPA grant. ARPA was the recovery from COVID. And the grant is for our archives. We have been doing tremendous work on our archives. When I started in 2020, it, there was some archives organized, but a room with tables just full, just piled up with papers. It's been organized, and ladies have been going through these boxes for three, four years now. 
Well, kind of know what's in a lot of them, still don't know what's in some, it's an overwhelming job. But we are just about ready, maybe even next week, to start putting things online on Connecticut Archives Online so you can be at home and see, right now the first thing that's going to go up is boxes of genealogy, it's just family names, and you can go up and see, type in, and see if we have anything on whatever subject you search. And then you won't see it online, but you can make an appointment and come into the Historical Society and we can pull that for you and we have a copy machine and a, where you can take photos with your phone. Um, so that's really a very cool thing because we have some very interesting things in our archives. <clears throat> and um, another, I'll just tell you one very cool thing that we found in our archives, only because it went down, <laughs> is um, for some reason, we found five Civil War newspapers in the archives. No idea how they got there, because you have to remember that this archive collection started with Nellie McKnight in the, well, she started collecting things, you know, in 1900. We have every diary of Nellie McKnight from 1908, the year she died in 1981, she wrote a diary, it's this tiny little, but we have these five, newspapers and couldn't figure out why do we have Civil War newspapers. And the only thing we could figure out with the help of the Civil War Museum in um, Vernon is that the contingency that they wrote about was from the Midwest and there was a town, Ellington, there and they thought with Ellington and somehow we got them. Mm -hmm. But what happened during the Civil War, these contingencies would camp, you know, for months at a time waiting to march south and they would hire the local <coughs> printing to have a newspaper. There's hundreds of soldiers in the eight printed newspapers and there were not that many left. There's certainly some left because then they would light fires with them. But one of the newspapers was called the Swamp Angel. And the Swamp Angel, it was significant, <laughs> the newspaper's in perfect condition. It's significant because there was a battle at the end of the Civil War. It was a black contingency fighting against the Confederates. And they were losing terribly and they surrendered. And the Confederates slaughtered. And it was never really documented. And in this Swamp Angel newspaper, that battle is documented. So the Civil we called up the Civil War Museum and said, we have this. It's probably really better in your possession. They were thrilled. And they have preserved these newspapers. And they set up in the Civil War Museum a little corner with those and features a couple of Ellington and Civil War soldiers, too. So if you've never seen the Civil War Museum, it's pretty cool. It's open, I think, Saturdays and Sundays. It's in the building of the Vernon Town Hall. Does anybody have any questions about anything? No? You showed a map of the Crawleys, and mm -hmm. it didn't have Holmes Road or Syndicate Point on there. Mm -hmm. Do you have any history of when Syndicate Point was? Um, the point on the lake? The Syndicate Point is Holmes Road off of Conklin Road. It's east of the, the mm -hmm. dam. And it's, it wasn't on your map. And you made a statement about how there was nothing on the east side of the... Early on. Right, nothing. and that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so t um, my question is, do you have any history on the creation of the homes and etc. on... Not that I know of, of when that started to be... I don't know when they built... I think it was where they, when they built East Shore Road. I don't know the date of that. Right. Was the thirty in right in front of my house to go down to the snip. The trolley did? Yeah. Do you know when they built East Shore Road? No. Yeah. It was many, it was a long time. And there used to be a little store right in front of the property on my house. No. No. Lived there. And there used to be a hotel on the town side. Because the bus used to come built in the town. Uh -huh. And the people would get off and stay at the hotel. Was the trolley on the west side of what's now Route 30? Yes. Or on the east side? Let me see west. if I find the trolley. I'll, I'll find the trolley map. Yeah. Let's go find the it. trolley road uh, yeah. is right where Route 30 and Birdbrand grows. I mean, it's on a different path that goes straight down. Yeah. 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 
I don't know if that helps. Because, but it's because the leg is so small on this mound. See where the leg is? Yeah, it's so small. This leg's way up there. Yeah, it's, it's just small. But see how the snip is so much bigger? Or this, I don't know if just this is snipsically and not all. I think this is the actual water, and no, this that's, that's is all. like that's the, all the, the... That's all the way. The, that's all the way. That's that's all all the way. Not Those lines are topographic lines, so the yeah. central yeah. one tells the bottom. Right. So snipsically so so is way bigger than this yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. The, the central one is like the bottom of it, and then the next the one is... Deck. The deck. The deck. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions at all? Yeah. Was it, does it land acquisition when they took down the ball? No. It was not land. The question was, was it land acquisition that they took down the ball? No. Pagani's owned it. Pagani's got old. Their sons owned it and didn't do very well. Yeah. And the same thing happened with... Um, the Sandy Beach one, it was a couple, I don't think they had children. And so there was no one to take over. But the Pugani next generation did not do well with the ballroom and it went out of business. And actually, Crystalline firemen had fun burning some of those buildings. <laughs> or practice. I didn't say fun, they probably did have fun, but they used them, many of the things around Crystal Lake to practice putting out fires. Yeah. So before the town bought Sandy Beach, what stopped the roller skating and the slide and everything that's going on there? What stopped it? Yeah. The people that owned it just got old. And it's just old and didn't run it anymore. No. No. Do you remember riding a pony there? My mother told me I rode ponies. I believe her. <laughs> you probably did. They did everything. It was referred to in newspapers as Little Coney Island. So I believe there is probably pony runs there. <laughs> believe her. <laughs> so I'll give you a teaser on some of the topics for it happened in Ellington, believe it or not. The story of the bouncing pickle, does anybody know? <laughs> so you have to come, if I tell you the story, you have to promise either to join, I'll tell you the story if you join. <laughs> so let me just say about joining the Historical Society. So historic, you can join the Historical Society and you don't have to do anything. You're just supporting us with your $25 membership fee. So if anybody's willing to do that, we'd be greatly appreciative. Or you can help do what a little or a lot, um, but there's no pressure. So the pickle story. <laughs> so down by where, um, it's by Windermere and Village Street in Ellington, which is where um, the barnyard has their facility where they build their things, that area. But that thing right down there next to the barnyard, there was a factory in Ellington. It was a five-story factory at one time, burnt to the ground, and that got rebuilt as a three-story factory. They actually sourced the water for that factory from the Four Corners in Rockville, Walgreens, 7-Eleven, following me. So Walgreens, then there's a house right there. In back of that house, that house is abandoned now. In back of that house is a Hockenham. There's a trench or a canal that went from the Hockenham there all the way to that mill over wow. by where the barnyard right has. So it was most um, profitable and prolific during the Civil War. They made blankets and mostly blankets. I don't know that there are all that many uniforms, but uniforms too. And it was many, many things over the years. It was lace, it was a balloon factory, it was many things. In the 1940s, it was a pickle factory. And the local farmers grew pickles for that factory. Well, they arrested the owners for selling rancid pickles. And they took them to court. They were arrested. Um, and when they went to court, the I don't know if it was like a commissioner of something. He basically got up there and he, you know, they have magnets, they have mold, but you take a pickle 
and you drop it a foot. Supposed to bounce. That pickle splats. Guilty. They try to find the guy guilty. They find five hundred dollars, and they basically chased him out of town. <laughs> Took his pickles, threw all his pickles away. And so, legend. There is a legend that people think that there is a law in Connecticut that the pickle has to bounce when it's dropped. <laughs> but that is not a law. It is folklore. There is no law, but that's where the story comes from. So the Hartford Yard Goats last year for one game said, this game we are Hartford Bouncing Pickles. <laughs> this whole thing on Bouncing Pickles. And um, that is the story of the Bouncing Pickle. So Ellington is famous. But we've had some famous people in town. We've had the second President of Mitsubishi Company, went to school in Ellington with Edward Hall Sewell. Um, William Howard Taft, President, his father, taught in Ellington. He walked from Vermont. Um, Jefferson Airplane Guitar's parents are buried in Ellington Cemetery. They were like some of the Jewish um, farm, uh, immigrants from Russia, farmers. Um, we have a lady that wrote a very famous hymn. We are, the two schools, there was an Ellington school and the, and the um, Edward school, Edward Paul school. So, Pitty, Frog Hollow, right? The house, Baptist Church, next house. That was John Hall's house. Across the street was the Ellington school. And at first it was a boys' school, then it was co ed at a big school, 100 people, 100 students, big school, burned down. Very famous, and that's the one Taft's father taught at. And then on Main Street, the house, it's, I think it's blue now, and it's three stories. I was at his son, Edward Hall School, and that was a very well-known boys boarding school. That was only like 12 students. But think of this, 1860, they get a guy, how long did it take the kid to come from Japan to go to school there? I mean, what did it take you two years to get here, and then you went to school for four years, and then you went, I, I mean, I just mind boggling. So I'd love to know how that kid got here. But very significant because of halls. So the hall is John Hall, Edward Hall, oh, I forgot the last guy's name, the brother of Edward. He gave the money for this library. And that's them back there, their pictures. Um, and he, uh, I think Francis Hall. And Francis had some connection with Japan, and that's how the man, how this young man came and went to school in Ellington. But Francis used to go to Japan. I just find that amazing. How, how did he get to Japan in 1870? I don't know. Take your time. <laughs> that's it. So sign up for our newsletter, if you will. Take some